Welcome to the next video in the mathematical logic sequence, talking about propositional logic, <clears throat> and in this video covering completeness and compactness. Okay, to begin with, I'm going to state a fact without proof because the proof is very easy. The fact is that if X is a maximally consistent set, then, if it, then it proves negation alpha if and only if it does not prove alpha. I'm going to use that fact in the proof of the next fact, which is that every consistent set is satisfiable. Now, the book says this slightly differently. It says that every maximally consistent set is satisfiable. I thought it was nice just to sort of go ahead and say the slightly stronger version because it is so easy in the proof. Right? is basically just going to go, okay, take any consistent set, we know that it can be extended to a maximally consistent set, and then from there we just pick up the proof exactly the same way as in the book. So I just wanted to maybe uh, state it slightly stronger, even though it's a tiny lift. So anyway, so for the proof, we will take any consistent set and let x be the maximally consistent extension, and then we will use that maximally consistent set to build a model which satisfies it. So in particular, if X proves any atomic formula, then we will have the model assign that formula true and otherwise assign it false. Okay, so now we want to show that W in fact satisfies x, which is to say every formula in x is satisfied by w. To that end, right, we'll do this by formula induction, and so we're going to start with the atomic formulae, and that is almost just by construction of w, right? So if you take a formula in x that is atomic, then x proves that formula, and by construction of w, therefore w satisfies that formula. Now, moving on to the rest, we're only going to consider formulae constructed with conjunction and negation, and we're going to take every other formula as basically equivalent to something constructed in those components. And if we wanted to extend our proof system such that those other symbol, right, formulae that are built from those other symbols, uh, we would have like have some proof rules that allow us to prove the equivalence of them. And then, you know, right, so, uh, so if anything can be proved, uh, then it's equivalent formula could be proved and so on. Anyway, so, you know, going right over the details, we're doing the inductive case, which means that we want to consider some two formulae alpha and beta such that they satisfy the inductive hypothesis, which is to say that if they are in X, then W satisfies them. Starting with the conjunction case, right, we suppose that alpha conjunction beta is in X, right, if it weren't, then, then we wouldn't be worried about it. So let's assume that alpha conjunction beta is in X. Our goal is to prove that W satisfies alpha conjunction beta. Now, since that is in X, and we know by one of the, the conjunction rules that therefore X proves each of alpha and beta. Now, from there, we would like to point out that X is contained in, or sorry, alpha is contained in X and likewise for beta. Now, that is true. I have written the proof basically off to the side, right? So the basic idea is that since X proves alpha and X is consistent, then, in fact, alpha is already in X, and this is generally true for any maximally consistent set. So, although, right, as you see, I have written here, uh, really, if I'm starting with the argument that if X is consistent and proves alpha, then X union alpha is also consistent, right? And I give a quick argument here saying, well, basically just use the cut rule, right? If you suppose sort of for contradiction, that x together with alpha proves falsum, then that together with the original assumption that x proves alpha, the cut rule lets you uh, infer that uh, x proves falsum, which is contrary to x being consistent. So there's that proof, right? So, so that's a nice quick proof that if a consistent set proves a formula, then the union with that formula is also consistent. Now, using that, we can argue that if X is maximally consistent and proves a formula, then that formula is already in the set, right? So 
So taking x to be maximally consistent now, we know that of course it is a subset, that's trivial. And also from what we just showed that this, this superset x union alpha is consistent, therefore, right, as maximally consistent sets have the property that any superset is, is inconsistent, any proper superset is inconsistent, but this is a, a superset and therefore can't be proper, so we must have equality. And then from that, right, basically that's just telling you that unioning with alpha added no extra elements, so alpha was already in x. So there's the proof of that. So long story short, if x proves something, then that something is already in x. And now we get to use the inductive hypothesis to say that w satisfies alpha based, right, because uh, alpha is in x, and so the inductive hypothesis tells us that w satisfies alpha, W satisfies beta, therefore by our semantics, W satisfies the conjunction. Similar story for negation, and we're done. W satisfies X, X is satisfiable. Therefore, right, it's, it's a very easy proof that W satisfies the set that we started with, right, because after all, X is the maximally consistent extension, but of course, if it's extending it, then it also proves the small or satisfies the smaller set. Okay, moving on to completeness, I do want to point out one small thing, which is that the uh, the difference between how I use the word completeness and how the book uses the word completeness, it's not a big difference. So I agree with the book that soundness means whenever there is a proof, then it is valid, which is basically to say this part right here, that if X proves alpha, then X entails alpha. What is different for me is that I'm used to saying completeness is just the other direction, whereas the book takes completeness to be the bi-directed arrow. It's not going to change my proofs and, it, you know, it's, it's barely a difference at all, but I do, I, I'm only going to prove the right to left direction that if X entails alpha, then X proves alpha. The previous result that we just proved is almost the entire proof of completeness. To see this, suppose that X entails alpha. Well, we want to get this into a shape that says something about sort of consistency and satisfiability. So let's go ahead and take alpha, move it over to the other side according to, you know, one of our rules. That tells us that x together with negation alpha entails falsum. That is just the same thing as x together with negation alpha being unsatisfiable. And what did we just prove? We just proved that x... Uh, or if any set is consistent, then it is satisfiable. Since this is unsatisfiable, then it must also be inconsistent. That is to say, x together with negation alpha proves falsum, and then by one of our derivation rules, we can move the alpha back to the other side and say that x proves alpha. There's the proof of completeness. Okay, so we saw earlier that every proof uses a finite number of elements in the set, right? That is to say there is a finite subset such that the finite subset also does the proof, basically. We can now show that actually the same thing holds for entailment, that if x entails alpha, then there is some finite subset such that this finite subset basically does the entailment, and we go by way of the completeness so to see how we fill in these details, suppose that X proves alpha, or sorry, suppose that X satisfies alpha, then X proves alpha, then a finite subset proves alpha, then that finite subset entails alpha. Pretty straightforward. Next, we get a result that is pretty valuable in its own right, and it is the statement that if every finite subset of a set is satisfiable, and the entire set is also satisfiable. So, you know, just to get a little bit of intuition about like why this is somewhat interesting to begin with, right? If you think if you think that X is some finite set, well, this is just trivial, right? This actually says pretty much nothing at all because if X itself is finite, then you could take the finite subset, which is all of X, and we would be saying, Right, we would be assuming that this finite subset is satisfiable, therefore all of X is satisfiable. Well, that's just trivial, right? They're completely uninteresting. So this is only interesting when X is infinite. Now, if you imagine X as this infinite space of formulae, then what you kind of imagine we're saying here 
is that if you take a finite subset, in some sense you kind of imagine covering it with a finite blanket, grabbing all those formulae together, and you say that portion is satisfiable. And then you grab some other finite portion of it, and you say that's satisfiable, and you keep doing right, but you keep laying blankets, finite blankets, over portions of X, and every time you do it, you get a satisfiable set. But that it's not completely trivial that therefore there is, right, like when you kind of extend the blanket all the way out to infinity, that that thing, right, when you grab all of the formulae in X, that that thing is satisfiable. So that, right, it's not obvious. And so compactness is the theorem that guarantees us that actually it is true. That if you could do this in a finitary way, then in fact there must be some way of doing it for the entire infinite set. And the proof of compactness uses what we just proved about entailment using finite subsets, right? So we're going to prove this by way of the contrapositive. So we're going to assume that x is unsatisfiable and then use that to prove that there must exist some finite subset which is unsatisfiable, right? That is the contrapositive. If that's not immediately clear, then take a minute to think about why that is the contrapositive. But, so that's our goal. So let's go ahead and say, well, okay, so if X is unsatisfiable, then it entails falsum. And because X entails falsum, then some finite subset entails falsum by what we just proved a moment ago. And then that means that this finite subset is unsatisfiable. So there you have it. That, that's the whole proof.